<clears throat> so good morning, uh, everybody, and sympathy to those of you that are hearing me speak for the fourth time since Friday. I think it's been about 11 hours of uh, talking so far that I put you through. Um, as opposed to everything that we've done thus far, which was really clinical based, looking at where things are at right now, trying to put a lens on the evidence and see if what we're doing is right and what we can do better. This is taking a step back and looking at the other 40% of the time that I spend in life, and that's uh, running the lab and you know scrambling for funding and, and trying to build something that may or may not uh, advance the field forward with regards to nerve regeneration and nerve protection. Um, the only other thing that's different from this slide set, now, now apparently I got an email last night that I'm part of the Department of Cellular and Molecular Medicine, so just the business card needs to get fixed again. Um, and if this is, the advancer is going to work, excellent. So the acknowledgments, uh, as they are, any time uh, any of us speak, we should acknowledge the people who have supported us. So there's a, a short list of uh, some of the, the more active funding, and we've got some other things that are going on. And you know, you guys have the, the, the biggest world-level center with Dr. Gleave here for prostate. So we're like a fly speck in the global landscape of research. But uh, again, even the fly specks got lucky sometimes, and we're going to be able to share some of that today. What we're going to try to do really in about 40 minutes that we have left uh, is to go over a little bit, you know, is there a need for this kind of research and are, are we really spending limited dollars from across the board wisely? And if my clicker is going to work efficiently, this is going to be better. So is somebody trying to WebEx me? Yeah, okay. Uh, we'll look at very briefly for, for uh, myself and for the house step primarily, uh, where we're at with nerve cell and neurovascular bundle biology, and look at some select research programs. Again, I'm, I'm not going to stand up here and do a, hey, look at me, I'm patting myself on the back for what we've been able to accomplish. Just a couple things that may make some sense and also potentially serve as a little bit of inspiration to those of you that are early in your careers and want to do some academic uh, uh, research, especially if it's basic science, because it does take a lot of time. And it's a lot different than doing clinical research or putting together a protocol, plugging it in, having a whole team to help you out and go forward from there. You know, one of the eye-openers that I had when I was a visiting prof here three years ago is when Marty took me through uh, the, the Prostate Cancer Research Center. And one of the wisest things he told me, which I've tried to adhere to, was everybody's going to be trying to take your time for the A, B, C, D, E, F, and you only have a certain limited life of lifespan. Uh, so I've really tried to cone down on things that, that may make some sense and, and have some evidence for it. We all know the prostate cancer story, and we do know the fact that uh, we do have collateral damage when we treat men. And they're going to be around for a long period of time. This is modified from Chris Morash's slide. In 2012, especially with the amount of low-risk disease that we treat, you know, this is a prostate cancer that's a turtle in a box, and if we choose to treat it and not do some watchful waiting or or other uh, strategies. Uh, these guys are going to be around for a long, long time. So then what we're dealing with is collateral damage for a long, long period of time. And is this really important? So if you look at what goes through the mind of a patient and if they have their partner at the time of prostate cancer diagnosis, it better be survival, 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 cancer control, cancer control, cancer control. We went over this last night, so I'm not going to harp on it. That is by far the overlying priority. Uh, the next step is going to be incontinence. But ED is a fairly significant player, and if you only, ha you only have to look at the amount of energy and finances that are expended in, in the United States on trying to figure out ways to mitigate the damage that happens. We did the review uh, for, I think it was Annals of Internal Medicine as well, and we looked at you know, the probability of clinically compromised potency across the board, uh, regardless of whether it was robot, uh, lab-assisted, or open. And it's really two and three. And again, uh, yesterday or the day before, we talked about <coughs> honesty and reporting and giving patients messages that are specific to your own practice and being realistic with the fact that if you take baseline erectile function and you do surgery, the return to that baseline erectile function without the use of any erectogenic aids is going to be in the low 40%. If you're then mixing into PD-5 inhibitors to get them to where they were at before surgery, it's less than 70. Uh, if you move your metrics around and do some creative analysis, you're going to you know, come up with publicity stunts like a 98% return of potency at three years, which simply doesn't exist if you look at it from an evidence-based approach. So again, the research that we're doing is peripheral nerve. So it's not only limited to where we work, which is again cavernous nerve injury to predetermined uh, time, this has potential for other traumas. Uh, also, uh, you know, brachial plexus injuries or 
or anything that's that's peripheral nerve, there are some shared aspects of response to injury or trauma. And uh, you know, we see this whether it's a fractured pelvis or low bowel cancer treatment. Uh, a shorter version of last night, so when it comes to ED, it's multifactorial in almost all cases, but we've got some specific steps that we can jump on with regards to prostate cancer treated men. Bottom line is, is no matter how we're approaching it, we are going to cause neurologic injury by getting that prostate where it belongs, which is in a jar in the pathology lab. And then it's a pretty predictable sequence of events that happens. This is no different than somebody who breaks a humerus or has a, uh, a brachial plexus injury where you end up having functional denervation downstream to muscle tissue. What happens to that muscle tissue? It starts to atrophy, you start to have changes. Those ischemic changes can be permanent and that function never returns back to normal. So in the penis, that ends up being cavernosal smooth muscle. So I'm not a smooth muscle biologist. Where I'm looking at is again at the upstream injury that happens at the time of treatment and going from there and trying to prevent those sequential secondary changes. From a basic penile physiology, uh, this talk's going to be archived, so I think that that's this is one of those things in a limited time that we can just look at the fact that the currency of erectile function is nitric oxide, and what you really need to have is that nitric oxide being released and allowing for smooth cell relaxation. It would be so much easier in life if cavernous nerve anatomic distribution was like this. You know, you have a couple bundles on the side of the prostate or at sort of predetermined positions, maybe a little bit of netting in between that we're going to munch through anyways, and we go on from there. Well, it's not the reality of the situation. So why does ED occur? Again, if we're going to do research, identify the target, identify it early so you have a rational approach. It's neural trauma, and it's leading to these changes that are downstream. So. We've learned a lot from embryology, we've learned a lot from anatomic studies, and really this is two and three year old data, so the last time I was here, if I was giving this talk, some of this we wouldn't even know. So the reason this slide is important, it gives us an idea in embryology how you can start identifying cells that are cavernous nerve fibers. So this is VACTH and, and tyrosine hydroxynase stain fibers, and again, this will become relevant as we get into the little bit of show and tell on what we're doing in the lab. When it comes to what the fibers are doing around the prostate in embryology, what you have circled uh, is some of the fibers of the cavernous nerves as they're coming off of what would be the equivalent of an MPG in a rat. And what you see at the arrow are the, the cavernous nerves that are actually within the corpora. So it's this hair-like fibrous network that needs to come and coalesce and have these basically two little on-off switches which are responsible for your hydraulics kicking in. So these are mixed. One of the issues that happened traditionally is you just try to get any nerve regeneration back. So there was a lot of excitement about elect electrostimulation and trying to get nerves to, to regrow at, at better and faster and stronger. The problem is you ended up getting the off switches growing preferentially versus the on switches. So you're actually causing more erectile dysfunction. So these cholinergic bran branches are, are, are you know identified. You've got all these communications that happen, but it's a spray-like pattern. It's not just two bundles. And again, that's what makes things a little bit more complicated. So if we're looking at how well we spare nerves, spare nerves of prostatectomy, the first thing to do is take a step back. And again, somebody's trying to WebEx me here. Um, so nerve sparing means the sheath is intact. So you have some insulation on a power cord. And that power cord has the wires running through it. So that's the simplest way of looking at it. Non-nerve sparing, you can cut the darn thing in half. You can take out a four centimeter length. Or non-nerve sparing technically also means you did a beautiful nerve sparing procedure and this guy is unlucky because there was some sheath damage and what they ended up getting is one area of fibrosis across the nerve. So you can have 99% of the length is perfect and if it's a lesion like this going longitudinally, no big deal, you just have a decreased signal, fits straight through, transverse through the nerve. You've done a, you've done a nerve sparing procedure where the functional outcome is non-nerve sparing. And that's why even with the bilateral nerve sparing procedure, you will never get in reality, better than 88, 90% of recovery PD-5 assisted in these guys uh, if, if you super select your patients. So what is the nerve distribution? So this is where you build a bit of a story and, and start to see, okay, we do have some shortcomings that will likely never be addressed by dealing with prostate cancer by surgery. My job <coughs> will become irrelevant here and we will still do the peripheral nerve regeneration uh, research and neuroprotection research if somebody can come up with a molecule that sits on the darn prostate, makes prostate cancer a localized disease with no metastatic potential by doing something on the receptors, because then we're not disrupting the nerves. So now it wouldn't be an incontinence collateral damage, it wouldn't be an ED collateral damage, is because we're not going in and getting the prostate out. 
So hopefully that happens within you know my career, and hopefully the sooner the better, because we all have enough work to do, and I don't need more work to be generated. So what ended up happening that was interesting? Well, a quarter of the nerve fibers that actually are important for erections are on the ventral surface. For those of you that are going to be writing the exams, when you know you're thinking about the anatomy of the prostate and these nerves that trigger an erection, you're thinking, why am I even studying erectile dysfunction? Because it's not really going to be on the exam. Yeah, you're right, it won't be, but you're doing it because you're learning urology and you're hopefully enjoying it. But you've got 20, 25% are ventral. So the issue there is twofold. Number one, for, for guys, that's meaningful. Number two, this starts to explain some of the early studies that showed that uh, in the U.S., if you looked at lower volume urologists and, and saw if they did a bilateral non-nerve sparing procedure, there were still six or seven percent of guys that had meaningful erectile function. Well, non-nerve sparing didn't mean just sort of, you know, up on the top on the side kind of thing. It's because they actually preserved uh, enough of these ventral fibers or, which may have been the case as well, and I'm theorizing here, they really did an, a, a nerve sparing procedure and didn't realize it. So, where are we at now? Um, so Ganser's group, and this is 2009, looked at 30 whole mount sections. These were non-nerve uh, sparing. And what they started to find, and the arrows are showing nerve fibers that wouldn't be within a traditional area, and they're basically circumferentially being distributed. And again, you're getting this whole ventral story again. And then uh, Kaio's group in Japan went a, a little bit more elegant. And what they started doing was electrically stimulated the, the uh, prostate, basically almost like the face of a clock. And they found at 12 o'clock through 5 o'clock positions in mid-prostate with bipolar electrodes. And what happened is you saw these changes in erectile function or electro erection pressures. So again, there's a lot of evidence to show that it's not this simple sort of neurovascular bundle arrangement. So what are the clinical uh, implications? Well, you know, people have talked about using a standard versus intrafacial nerve sparing approach. And, and what you're trying to do there is drive preservation of nerve fibers by really cutting a little closer to the prostate. You know, the issue here is, is you will likely, especially in lower volume centers or high volume centers that don't quite do things as well as maybe we would like to do, uh, is you're going to start to have your margin rates go up. And as we talked yesterday, sorry, go back here for a sec, one of the drives of Cancer Care Ontario is to decrease margin status across the board. So it's uh, a surgeon friendly almost audit which is not really an audit and you look at margin rates and there's a target that needs to be attained and if you're not within that target uh, then you are suggested to either uh, work with somebody to work on your technique or to criti critically evaluate what it is you're doing at surgery well you know what's happened now and, and I've seen that in the last 12 months in the practice and sorry for repeating stuff we talked about last night is you're seeing more guys who technically are getting bilateral nerve sparing procedures coming in behaving not like guys who had bilateral nerve sparing procedures based on the last four years of data. So what's happening is the drive to margins is allowing for more collateral damage. So it's always going to be a balance, but the conversation with anybody who gets into uh, my clinic with regards to pre-prostate cancer counseling, and again we've got a unique situation, it's very artificial, and as Andrew said, is I've been able to really cone down, and those of you who've heard me talk know that basically it's the post-radical population, it's the treatment refractory ED, it's the Peronis guys, and select hypogonadism. So it's the Tom Liu of the North practice. So what does this mean for us? It means that even if we can spare them, there's edema, there's fibrous changes that can occur. We talked about a nerve sparing procedure where you don't get nerve sparing. So we have all this research happening, and this research is looking at everything and the kitchen sink, trying to figure out a way to preserve those nerves. And again, it's nerve, 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 causing downstream damage. So is the nerve cell really clinically relevant in this situation? Is this where should be, we should be focusing our effort? And the answer to that is, you know, you talk about multi-organ system failure. Well, I'm going to say that this is a multi-system organ failure. And the reason for that is the nerve cell is actually then buggering up downstream smooth muscle function, venous trapping, tunica or casing changes with regards to fibrosis, and you can really then go backwards and, and identify that the mitigating or the causality circumstance here is that surgery and injury. So, Dr. Liu and I, in 2004 or five, put together this slide, and unfortunately it still applies. We have absolutely nothing that we're doing at the time of the insult to the nerve that helps change natural history. 
everything that we do, every strategy that's out there, every purported penile rehabilitation uh, uh, program is all reactive to the secondary effects and trying to <laughs> have those effects be the least amount possible. So apoptosis, hypoxia, fibrosis, smooth lo muscle loss. And we're doing this with, again, whatever we have available, PD-5 inhibitors, injections, now vacuum pumps have some better evidence from Runwag and MD Anderson and Andy McCullough just presented a week and a half ago on some oxygenation data with the vacuums. And so there's a lot of stuff that we're doing. Um, and as we spent probably about 45 minutes last night, uh, we don't have a universal approach. We have some evidence. Some of it's conflicting. But from a treatment standpoint, it appears that we should be offering some penile rehabilitation or collateral damage mitigation strategies because some of them make sense and some of them actually do have some evidence. And it's cutting through the chaff to get to the wheat that's the tough part. So this is why my job is easy. And why do I say that? So when I gave the cellular molecular grand rounds to a whole bunch of neuro guys and molecular medicine, uh, cellular molecular medicine people who have no clue about prostate cancer and really can give any sort of second thought to their erections unless they have ED. Um, they were really intrigued by this and it is causing a lot of potential collaboration and ideas to be coming my way because in most situations you don't have a predictable time of injury. We do. We know when this is going to happen. So if there are strategies that we can do to rev up, for example, your endogenous system to respond better to a nerve injury, this is one of the unique aspects in medicine where we can do that. And this is where you'll see a, th a third of my program is looking at sitting duck and trying to do things before the injury happens to get your body's response to be optimized. And where does this come from? This comes from classic neurotrophic factors. So uh, again, that literature is now, you know, five to seven years old uh, in that cavernous nerve specific uh, literature supports survival, differentiation, recovery. What happens after an injury? Well, you know, to put it simply and not spend an hour just on this process, you have sprouting that happens from the damaged area. If it crosses over the damaged area and then ca can cause, and this is the key point, functional re -innervation. You can grow nerves across an injury. That's been going on for a long, long time. It's the right nerve fibers and making sure that those terminal nerve endings are actually doing something at the smooth muscle cell level. And that's what makes it harder. And when it comes to parasympathetic neurobiology, uh, there hasn't been that much research that has shown how these processes occur. And what we see as functional recovery in our patients is slow. You know, there are several centers data that, that are postulating and having some evidence showing that recovery isn't just maybe two years, but it can be at the three and four and four and a half year mark. Again, I caution everybody to look at those metrics on how they're measuring that uh, and, and seeing how clinically relevant it is versus, you know, delineating a statistical effect. But the assumption has been that there's limitation to nerve regeneration. Well, it used to be thought, even when I went through undergrad, that nerves really don't regenerate or certain types of nerves regenerate. And uh, thankfully, the field has come forward quite a lot. So an example of some of the knowledge that has been put forth in the last five or six years, Nangel and Keese have done some nice work where they've looked at NNOS fiber uh, immunoreactivity in, able, in an effort to be able to show how you can identify these nerves within the corpora cavernosa themselves. Uh, before this, even in Tom Liu's group, what was happening is you were using the dorsal penile nerve as a surrogate for nerve preservation. And frankly, again, that's what we knew. That was our best measure at that point in time. But if you can measure what's happening within the corpora, that makes a heck of a lot more sense because that's where the smooth muscles where you're trying to find out whether you still have functional preservation. So things have moved along. We can do all sorts of electrophysiologic testing. And really, this is the backbone of any nerve injury um, research is, you know, identify reasonable functional uh, recovery first because if you're going for molecular changes you can make a western or you can make PCR <coughs> tell a story for you but if it doesn't have any relevant potential for translation you're doing it for the sake of doing research and again uh, in, in my lab with <coughs> limited resources it's, it's all about can we translate 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 and does it make sense so the classic neurotrophic factors rationale is that if you modify them you have better recovery 
uh, areas there being nerve growth factor, brain derived nerve growth factor. Uh, that's why I did a lot of my early uh, research. And the good news on that is all of that early research has really formed the bedrock for multiple lines of research because there's some commonality as to how important this is uh, to the nerve and its recovery. Um, from a technical standpoint, as we start to get a little bit into the part where everybody falls asleep and then we wake <laughs> you up at about 10 to 8 to go back to work, um, what happens with the uh, brain-derived nerve growth factor or the neurotrophins, they bind to specific receptors and those respect receptors better be present in the tissues that we're trying to identify. Um, so this is some collaborative work that has gone on since, uh, since I uh, finished getting wonderful training from Dr. Liu. Um, early stuff, again, this is now 2006. These are some of the, the early kind of uh, research wins that we had. If you cut across a rat nerve and then you manipulate the environment and give some brain drive neuro nerve growth factor, you end up driving this um, nerve regrowth or axonal sprouting. The good news is, is you've got the on switches being regenerated, not just the off switches, so that was quite an important step. Then we were able to uh, look at, you know, dose dependency, and that's important because if you're going to do anything practical in a human being, uh, there are toxicity issues and there are practical delivery issues. So again, driving uh, axonal regeneration was a good first step. Then we were able to start to look at, well, what's the mechanism there? And it has to do with time-dependent de phosphorylation. And why is this important? It's important because if we're trying to translate this to our patients, a lot of the stuff we'd have to be doing within hours of injury, if not within the first week to 10 days, because uh, some of the, the potential regenerative benefit actually then uh, is lost. Uh, you know, you, you go from petri dish, you go to in vivo data, and what you're seeing is the same kind of uh, phosphorylation activation relationship, and that's from European urology. But that's now five and six years old data, and you didn't have me come here to do a historical talk. But again, I'm just setting the table. You've got these receptors that are there in the major pelvic ganglion. What ends up happening then is if you can activate uh, uh, Schwann cells, you're having BDNF-induced uh, cytokine secretion from the Schwanns, and now you're starting to activate a whole set of machinery that's geared towards recovery. And that's where it's exciting for me. So if I can go upstream high enough and then activate <coughs> what's already there and do it more efficiently or prep it for the injury, I think that's where we're going to at least have uh, a viable option for peripheral nerve regeneration and nerve protection. And the second thing is this will be complementary to any pharmaceutical approach or most pharmaceutical approach if we do come up with drugs that, that make some sense here. So one of the other things that, that we all know when we talk to our patients is ED recovery after radical prostatectomy is going to be dependent upon age, pre-existing pre erectile function, and nerve sparing status. So what is it about age? And, and this I need to get written up because it's really neat and it's been sitting on my desk for over a year. Um, what we end up having is if you take an aged rat versus a young rat and you add BDNF, you're having differential effects on that axonal sprouting. Different study was then done to look at why this happens, and you're going to look at them and say, okay, Tony, why are you showing us the bottom penile numbers because those error bars are massive, and I'm not really seeing any difference at 24 hours, and if you're talking about this timing thing and a difference in age, you're not telling the story. That was in the details. If you look at the, the actual axis, this goes to 40. This goes to 300. What are we finding? We know that in a younger animal, you have a better endogenous response. What happens as you get older, you lose that endogenous responsibility or it becomes muted. And that's likely one of the reasons why a guy who's 50 and is exactly the same guy as a guy who's 60 won't have the same erectile function recovery if you look at nerve function. So that's a fairly important uh, step and that needs to get out there. Uh, we then looked at that from a uh, molecular confirmation standpoint and again the story continues it's the same thing so if you look at end organ response so what's important here you have damage at the nerve injury and things are happening proximal and distal to the nerve injury if you can optimize that especially if there's a compromised state uh, you can drive potentially better recovery and all of these findings showed that you know the growth factor response is blunted as part of aging and that's a really cool ringtone um, what ends up happening is if you can enhance this and other growth factor responses, you can translate into better functional preservation. And I'm actually doing decent from a time-wise standpoint, so that's good. So does any of this happen? And the one thing about research is, you know, you're sitting there with your lab group and you're like, hey, great job, everybody. And you're kind of saying, this is wonderful and important. And nobody comes to your lecture and nobody really cares. 
Um, well, Bud Burnett gave uh, a, a nice complimentary, and, and Bud obviously spending a lot of time doing uh, different lines of research in the same area. And the whole BNNF story ended up being quite important because of its transferability to other approaches. And so it was nice to get some external validation. It also helps with getting grants once you get other people on board who end up probably being your reviewers when they're blinded. Uh, so let's go through a couple programs. This is GGF2. Uh, if you were absolutely bored two weeks ago and Googled my name and was wondering what the heck I may be talking about when I come here, you would have seen a whole bunch of Reuters and Bloomberg hits and stuff. Uh, it's because this actually went public in a fairly big way. Um, and, and this is the story here. If you have a molecule that you can deliver remotely from your site of injury, so if I can give an injection or a sub-Q, whatever, and if it can target or cone down to a site of injury, that has real potential when it comes to our prostate cancer treated guys. Because one of the issues is you're doing the surgery, it's not like it's going to be easy to paint on some sort of gel in the general area and get it to where you need it. What you need is something that targets or cones in. The other thing is from a cancer control standpoint, if this ends up showing that there's very little or no cancer potential, um, then you've got something that, that is going to be ease of delivery and potentially some or maximal benefit. And the good news on, on this whole area of research is, again, it can be complementary to other approaches. So GGF2 is a target um, that allows, sorry, is a molecule that allows for, for remote from site delivery. And this ends up being tied back to the whole BDNF story. And the back back story on this is I was at a neuroscience conference and it was just trolling through a whole bunch of neuroscience posters and they were talking about this for <clears throat> spinal cord. And so I started talking to the person who was presenting and they looked at me like I literally had three eyes, one in the middle of my forehead and it was like, you know, I'm talking about peripheral nerves and what happens if you have timed injury. Um, but Tony Caggiano, who is on the patent with me in Gen IAC now, um, he kind of put me aside and said, you know what, I don't know who you are, but what you're talking about is very interesting. You know, can you spend some time? So this is one of those things where it's just stroke of luck and stroke of luck. This company was a small little, you know, $50 million kind of outfit, and they had proprietary intellectual protection on GGF2, uh, just from a molecule standpoint, uh, because of the way they do their human recombinant protein splice variation with neuregulins, uh, they, they had the best way that I could approach it. So it was just pure luck I was there that day. The second thing is, is these guys have the only uh, oral uh, multiple sclerosis drug that's out there that improves function. So they went from a little outfit to a $3 billion company uh, within a very short period of time so what ended up happening there is, is happens in most academic institutions. Uh, I put the, them together with our team. I wrote and designed what needed to happen, and now the university will get some residuals and I get to present. So um, hopefully this ends up being something that's uh, potentially important. And the reason for that is this is, again, peripheral nerve injury. This is not just prostate cancer, guys. So what ended up happening, we looked at our standard way of seeing if there were any functional differences first. And what you're seeing in the top right, uh, as you have increasing dose of GGF2 after a cavernous nerve crush injury, you have more recovery of intercavernous pressure. So that's all fine and dandy if your rats all have the same blood pressure results and there's no variability. So what you need to do is you need to go and uh, control it to aortic pressures and the same uh, <coughs> response was noted. One of the things that I talked about last night was the fact that we have so much animal data and that animal data always seems to support whatever people are doing. And one of the reasons is because people, the, the groups aren't truly blinded at every step of the, the way of either gathering your tissues or your data or analyzing it. And this is where this was quite strong because this was absolutely blinded across the board. Every person in my lab, none of us had any idea what we were interpreting when we were looking at this or looking at the tissues. Here's some cool stuff. So if you put fluorogold into the corporal cavernosa, which is a vascular chamber, it's going to be picked up by the terminal nerve endings. It's going to be then brought backwards across the area of injury to basically something called the MPG, which is where the nerve actually comes off of. So what are we measuring here? We are measuring the amount of nerve fibers that are actually functional there, alive, kicking, and able to do something. So the right-hand column, again, you can always pick your best um, images to tell a story. So this is telling a story right now. 
And this is what the reality of the situation is. So if you do fluorogo labeling counts, it's a significant uh, preservation of functional uh, fibers. Um, you can look at it in different ways. This, remember, we looked at the Nengel and Key stuff, and this is NOS, and looking what's happening in crush groups plus GGF2, and you have preservation right within the corporal smooth muscle where these nerves are supposed to be doing what they're doing. Same thing co comes from VACTH. So what was the conclusion here? This is an attractive uh, candidate when it comes to prostate cancer treatment. The functional data, you know, at that point supported some nerve regeneration and nerve protection. Uh, and for nerves that are injured, this really looks like it's, it's potentially going to preserve end organ function, which was really exciting. And at the end of the day, it was one lab doing a whole bunch of studies that cost quite a lot of money to do. Uh, and okay, fine, first step. Hopkins just confirmed all this stuff, which ended up being a material change in the company's direction, which is why it went sort of on the news wires, because this is now a program that is going to be pursued for peripheral nerve recovery. So again, just an example of right place, right time, lots of luck, uh, and being well trained. Um, somebody's trying to WebEx me again. So optimizing endogenous response. So we've got the sort of designer molecule, you know, let's set up some targets and hit them and be very precise. And then we've got the shotgun approach. And the shotgun approach, again, is not very efficient or good if you're trying to design something that's going to sit on a certain receptor. But if you're trying to drive endogenous neurobiological response, this makes some sense. So this actually started off from me seeing Ward Plunet at a neuroscience <coughs> meeting. And the i guys here at UBC were looking at caloric restriction and trying to help spinal cord recovery. And this made some sense in the spinal cord group, but it made a lot more sense for us. And again, this is truly sitting duck target at its best. Because if I can show or we can show that by doing something before surgery, we actually help the response to the nerve injury, this is then something that can be used uh, across the board as part of our prostate cancer pathways. So what we wanted to do as a first line is look at by if we restrict caloric, or restrict caloric intake, does it actually change what happens at the nerve level? And why is that? It's because every other day fasting has been shown across uh, species to be neuroprotective. Actually, it increases lifespan. It also decreases uh, tumor occurrence. So there's a lot of reasons why uh, North Americans are doing the opposite by loading in on the calories on a daily basis. So that's why we have lots of bad stuff going on. Uh, when it comes to neuronal uh, recovery, there are some mechanisms that have been implicated, but the one that was important for me was it made sense because it also looked at the neurotrophins, and neurotrophins are driven higher in your tissues when you're doing this, and if you have higher levels, we've seen from adding BDNF uh, to pathologic states that you help drive that nerve recovery. So the study design was very similar. Again, we had uh, uh, groups where you started the fasting two weeks before, at the time of injury and one week after. We presented this at the AUA and I think yeah, I was in the highlights last year too. Um, so what ended up happening is you do the functional and then you start to do the same thing. Again, some of this is repeat the same experiments and see if the stuff is working because the approaches actually do identify approaches that may be valid. And why do I say that? Because about 90% of the stuff that will test will fail the functional uh, first step and then you don't waste the money and the time and the resources on trying to look at the mechanisms. So we've got about 10 minutes left, so we're doing pretty well. So what ended up happening, so if you, if, if you just have an animal that has not had a nerve injury, that's what an electrophysiologic curve will look like. So that's a measure of the pressure within the corpora after electrostimulation. The controls, surprisingly and somewhat thankfully, were the same as the two-week post group. So if you had a nerve injury and you started the caloric restriction two weeks after the nerve injury, it was no better than just crushing it and doing no treatment. And why was that a good thing to see? Uh, and a little bit of a surprise, but a good surprise. Remember, you know, 57 slides ago, we talked about the timing aspect and how most of this stuff that if we can optimize, it looks like it's within the first couple of days to a week. Well, this starts to give at least another layer of potential uh, proof to that. Proof is a strong word, so I guess plausibility. Um, two weeks prior, though, you actually started to have a meaningful ICP response compared to what the controls are. And then again, a bit of a surprise. Sorry, I'll go back one slide. At the time of injury, you still had some improvement, but you didn't have nowhere near the same improvement levels as you did with 
the starting two weeks later. And again, conceptually, hypothesis, working on it, not there yet, maybe five years from now, if you invite <coughs> me back, I'll have a multi-layered uh, story that has stronger evidence for it. Um, this is the rubbing up of your endogenous system, more than likely. And you do need to, because if we measure, again, various surrogate factors that you can for what's happening with the neurotrophin response, you do need a lead time, and that probably reflects the lead time. So again, we looked at nitric oxide in, uh, in this corporal smooth muscle. Uh, one of the, the bad things that happens in science is that you use an animal model that doesn't reflect the patients you're potentially trying to translate to. Uh, aged cohorts are very expensive uh, to look at, and that was the data that I just showed. We had done a three-month cohort first to show whether there was actually any plausibility or, or any reason to be pursuing this whole every caloric restriction business. And what you're seeing in that slide is as you go to the two weeks pre-injury, you have a much better recovery rate than you do in the uh, old group. And the same thing is with the sham, they have some better erectile function as they're younger versus older. And again, that reflects biology. Uh, and that's important because if you had results in the three-month-old cohort, but you weren't able to drive some sort of improvement in the old group, this would have very little meaning for our guys because our guys are in their 50s and 60s. So the, the, the conclusions here uh, are that at this point we have a first line pass conferring, conferring uh, functional preservation. Uh, it decreases in age rat, rats, but it's still there. Uh, and it seems that if you start this earlier, and again, we don't know the optimal time because these are pilot studies, uh, then, uh, then this looks to be something that has at least uh, a reason to pursue. So Marty, if you're uh, reviewing the Department of Defense grants this year, um, you know, if there's every other day fasting, it's not me. I'm just kidding. They're, they're, we're, we're the only ones that are actually running with this right now, uh, mostly because uh, it, it was hard to get off the ground. Um, the other thing that we're looking at right now, which is very interesting, and it builds from uh, Craig Donatucci's early work at uh, Duke University, uh, and I just got a grant for this uh, early July, is adding uh, program exercise. So uh, exercise also does things to your endogenous response that may be of benefit. So we're going to be running a, a multi-armed variable controlled trial, uh, basic science, to see whether or not additive effects are observed. And if they are, then it starts to get really exciting. So the conclusions here are if you have something that has ease of translation, it may make sense to pursue from a research standpoint. You really need to show no uh, oncologic or oncogenic side effects. And it's always nice if the cost is low. So, you know, fasting is fasting. Um, and complementary to other strategies, the GGF2 story will be a cost thing too if it works out. But we'll deal with that as we come to it. Um, I'm going to speak, and I added this actually last night. And part of this is because uh, this is now on clinicaltrials.gov uh, and it's public information. And it's stuff that um, I had to sit on basically from the time I left UCSF uh, until actually the AUA this year. Um, the Saturday of the AUA was when this was made public. So this is a little bit newer. Uh, Cell-based therapy or using uh, autologous stem cells is a potential approach for various uh, tissue disruptions or pathologic states. And the interesting thing is it was thought that it can be directly incorporated into your tissues that are damaged. You know, I'll go through some of the evidence that shows that it's probably paracrine-mediated uh, uh, response. But the good news is if you're using your own stem cells that you can find in your own fat or other tissues, you're not going to have an immune rejection or a response. So cell-based therapy ends up using things like mesenchymal stem cells that are already there, like adipose-derived stem cells. And these can differentiate in the penis, but again, when it comes from a functional recovery standpoint, this looks to be growth factor based. And again, this rolls right back to the early things that Dr. Liu uh, allowed me to do and, and, and helped me kind of get things going with the BDNF story and everything. So again, if, if, if you've got something in the bank, you keep on going back to it if it makes sense. So what are the targets for cell-based therapy? What do we talk about with ED? We talk about nerve damage and smooth muscle dysfunction and endothelial dysfunction. So these are the different targets that, that uh, Hakim, and it was actually uh, Martin Albertson. Martin, if you're reading any stem cell stuff right now uh, that is really cutting edge, it's actually Martin Albertson uh, who trained with Tom Liu, and he's back in the Netherlands, and they're doing some really exciting high-end stuff uh, right now when it comes to using your own fat cells for, uh, for stem. Well, this was the initial concept. You have stem cells that are a building block. They stick around, they differentiate, and they help things out. 
Yeah, find some early evidence. This is uh, still from Dr. Liu's lab. The BRDU labeling where those arrows are shows that stem cells stuck around for a little bit. But you know what? That's not really the primary mechanism. What you're having is a promote and repair theory. And again, it's a theory, so there's a limitation. But what you're finding is there's more and more evidence to show that these mesenchymal stem cells, whether it's your own fat or otherwise, is allowing for things to improve through a cytokine and chemokine response. And when the work is completed, it's kind of neat because this is something that Dr. Liu has kind of made simple like he always does. Tom's great because he'll take complicated things, make it simple, and put it in the hands of everybody. The cells go home. And what does he mean by that is as soon as there's repair to the tissues, they actually go hide in the bone marrow or perivascular area. Why is that important? Because for, for most guys in North America, we have an ample supply of stem cells right about here and here. Uh, so it's not that hard to get at. Uh, cells go home. Again, give, give the bosses due. So what ended up happening is there have been several studies that are done, and again, this is all 2009, 10, 11, 12, where you've used either the stem cells or the lysate around the uh, stem cell preparations to drive recovery. And what happens here is you end up having uh, cavernous nerve injury where you do a crush, you have a, a gap or an area of damage, and then these ADSCs help recovery of function, just like you've seen with the GGF2 story and every other day fasting. Um, so there is an importance, statistically significant, and if you're looking at 20 to 30 uh, millimeters uh, of pressure change, that is potentially clinically relevant. What ends up happening, again, this is using that surrogate endpoint, so uh, the field has moved a little bit forward since, since this was done where they've looked at the dorsal penile nerve. The dorsal penile nerve, again, isn't responsible for erectile function. It never was. Um, and then Tom's group, again, has looked at SDF1 uh, expression and, and looking to see what actually happens when you inject a stem cell, uh, especially into the intercavernous space. Because if you're going to deliver these stem cells, you want to deliver them away from where you did your cancer operation. And we saw from the fluorogold, if you put it in the erectile chambers, it'll be picked up by the terminal nerve endings and fired backwards to the area of injury. So really the future of this is right now. And the reason I get to say this is since I left UCSF, uh, Francesco Montorzi and I have been working on putting together a stem cell trial based on the UCSF knowledge base, which was licensed out to a, a device maker company, actually. And what happened was uh, in May, just at the AUA, uh, this went live. And so five years of, of hard work trying to work through not only European regulation, but the FDA to get the science strong enough as well so that you can basically look at the burden of proof and see if this is a different is actually here. So this is running right now in the states. Uh, estimated enrollment is 30. There are, we're at seven already. Uh, the primary outcome measure, again, this is early trials is adverse events. The second, or the other co-primary is erectile function. Uh, secondary outcome measures obviously are going to be continence, treatment assessment, and erectile hardness. So we're looking hopefully at information that is is going to be available probably for AUA 2017 and again as as uh, Andrew said you know in Canada whether you're a huge machine when it comes to research or whether you're the fly spec guy sitting in Ottawa with a small group there are things that you can do and if you get lucky uh, where you may make an impact uh, that is uh, punching above your weight so the outline here was to look at some of the translational needs. I think we accomplished that. We looked at some of the biology and we looked at some research programs with translational potential. Thank you everybody for staying awake. It has been absolutely my pleasure to hit the ground running on Friday and uh, share everything that I know about urology. I'm plumb out of anything that I know, so I probably should go home. Thank you very much.